I'm an investor now, an armchair investor, which is primarily what I do with my money uh, and our family's money. And I absolutely love educating myself, um, whether that's through property, other investments. I'm not really a one trick pony. I like to sort of diversify as many people know. And, um, you know, I wouldn't say there was one thing that excites me more than the other. I just like to uh, make money, help people as and go along and try and build a bit of a brand along the way. So that's me, Matt. I don't know if you can give a bit of an overview to anyone who you are new to. Yeah, awesome, man. And I love what you said just there about, you know, not falling too in love with one thing. I think that's a really important thing as investors um, because a lot of us do fall into that trap. We become obsessed about, for example, property. I know most property investors only have property and nothing else. And that's what I admire definitely about you, Aaron, and we both share in common is we look at managing a portfolio of investments. So yeah, Matt Salt is here. Those who don't know me, uh, also known as the upgraded investor on Instagram and elsewhere online. Uh, I help conscious entrepreneurs to build wealth. And really what I'm all about is helping more business owners uh, to really transition from running an active business to managing a portfolio of cash flow assets. And I think that entrepreneurs, when we think about it, entrepreneurs are, are some of the people who need personal finance knowledge more than anybody else, because typically we're very good at creating income. Uh, but when I look at most, most of us, we're not necessarily the best uh, or we don't necessarily have access to the right information when it comes to expanding our wealth and building a portfolio that actually makes our money work for us. So that's really what I'm all about. I started my journey uh, as a graduate through the city of London, decided I wanted to learn about money and the financial system from the inside out. So I spent my time working on the investment banking floors and, and for funds in the, in the city of London, which as we speak today, obviously is largely a desert, right? There's nothing going on in the city of London because it's in lockdown. And uh, one of the interesting things I was thinking about actually is how the city of London population of less than 10,000 people in the square mile, right? The city of London, if you want to know uh, to, to feed into what we're going to be talking about, no doubt with Aaron, as we move on, the city of London has only got about eight or 9,000 people living there. 95% of the space, the, the, the buildings in London are commercial, they're offices, and right now they are empty. So the square mile is a classic example of the huge disruption that's happening right now in the world. And when has there ever been an opportunity like this on the planet to go and acquire assets or prime real estate, for example, in such a central and iconic location. So yeah, just, just a bit of background about me and, and what we're seeing today. Awesome. Cheers, Matt. Thank you, mate. Okay, so just to let everyone know, um, the topics that we're going to cover today and we're going to try and get through are one going to be on financial lessons from uh, what's happened due to COVID and what we've learned and how we can go forward. Um, and we're going to talk about you know, uh, mine and Matt's experience and hopefully sort of get around to a few of you or, you know, um, what you've learned. Second thing will be adapting to change. So obviously uh, businesses or individuals or whatever it is you're running, brand, business makes uh, neither here or there. Um, did you adapt? So everyone's had to adapt, whether that's, you know, just personally as an individual or, you know, whatever it is, have you adapted? If not, why not? And have you lost out from that? Because obviously there are businesses that, um, let me just get two more people on. There are businesses that have not adapted and unfortunately lost out. So that's going to be topic two. Then we're going to move on to topic three, which is the banking changes. Um, I'll give you my thoughts on why I believe the banking system. I'm a bit of a, I'm not a huge believer in the banking system. Uh, I don't particularly like any bank. Um, and I'm going to talk about that. We'll get Matt's views on that. And then coming up to the last couple will be number four, storage of wealth. Uh, you know, how are you how are you storing your wealth at the moment and how are you going to store your wealth? Are you, are you one of these people that's just going to leave it in the bank? Won't be me. Um, and then finally, it's going to be future money everywhere you turn. We're all it's all talking about Bitcoin. I'm no expert. Matt's got a lot of uh, experience with Bitcoin. And I know there's a lot of people on here just from two of my groups. I've got a mixture of my accountability 2.0 on here and my normal accountability. So, and Matt, I know that your community um, are in the crypto as well. So, what I will say just before we dive into it, any questions or anything like that, because of the time, stick it all in the chat and we'll try and come to it as we go along. So Matt, uh, let's start with you. What is, what's the biggest financial lesson that you've learned or that you've seen across the board that we can take? Mm. Yeah, good question to open up with, right? 
I think the the biggest thing the biggest thing that I've learned in life is how we have got to build a money making machine that is independent of us. We've all got to make that commitment if we want to weather the financial uncertainty that the present times and the all times ultimately present us with. Uh, so the biggest lesson for me is really, it goes back to the lessons in rich dad, poor dad. We have to make the conscious and intentional decision to move from not only the employee side of the quadrant, the cash flow quadrant, not to the self-employed side of the cash flow quadrant, which is typically where most business owners or people who call themselves an entrepreneur typically are, they're actually in the self-employed quadrant because they are trading time for money still. You want to transition to firstly the business quadrant where you've got systems and people that you're leveraging, but then ultimately move to the investor quadrant, which is where money works for us. So I think the biggest financial lesson that I had in my life was realizing that all of the super wealthy people, they have created a money machine that works for them outside of their main line of business. And this is the thing is a lot of us as entrepreneurs and business owners, as I know we've got on this call today, uh, and great to see a number of people tuning in from different parts of the world as well. I love that, right? The, the challenge that we have is that we become so obsessed about our businesses that we never build a strategic action plan of what we're going to do with our money as and when it comes in. And I think that is such a critical financial lesson that we've all got to grow into is we have to learn to become an investor. And being an investor doesn't mean it becomes your full-time business, but being an investor means that you've got the protection that you need with cash flow assets and an expanding portfolio to go out there and pursue your full potential in business. Because you can't pursue your full potential in business if your income changes when COVID hit or when lockdown hit. And I think what we learned the past 12 months was that we have to have a money-making machine for ourselves more than ever before because we're not in control of our businesses anymore, right? The government can strategically decide which sectors close. And so, so many families were hurt because they thought that the income from their business blindly would keep on coming in and they didn't make hay whilst the hay was coming in. They didn't reinvest that money. And so when the shutdowns happened, suddenly income stopped, there were no assets paying any, any of the bills. And that's been the big, I think, realization that a lot of us business owners have had recently is actually we need to build a portfolio of assets that allows our money to multiply. And that is the secret of all the super wealthy. They all have this. If you look at the Ray Dalios, the Warren Buffetts, even if you look at Tony Robbins, for example, Tony Robbins is a portfolio investor, yet most of us only see his speaking business. But that's not where his wealth is. His wealth is in real estate. Right. And it's also in the businesses that he's a partner in within the Tony Robbins partnership, this platinum program. Right. So he's another classic example. Grant Cardone, another one who, as we know, he's now building a massive real estate portfolio. And that's where his wealth sits. So I think it's something that's very critical that we all have to have a plan for. Yeah, I, to I totally agree. And you've actually just reminded me. So I know. Um, so basically, just I'll just give you an overview. I know a certain individual who to this day, Matt, um, is probably sitting on around about 220,000. It's just sitting in the bank. And that individual still six months later has not pulled the trigger to do anything with that money. And that 220K is sitting in the bank doing diddly squat. And I will have conversations every now and again about this individual and he'll say, you know, I'm looking to do this. But it's like Groundhog Day, never does anything with it, earns a really good income, has a very good wage and does nothing with the money. And that is my worst fear is that you sit on money and you do nothing with it. And, and what it was, and I, and I actually quote, and this is extremely bad. I like seeing the figure in the bank. How bad, like, how bad is that? Like, I hold barely nothing in the bank, like bare minimal um, because not only that, I've, we're, we're going to get onto the banking system anyway, and my, my beliefs around it or my theories of what, um, why I make certain decisions. But that's just a prime example of who gives two monkeys about how much is that you're actually sitting on. It means diddly squat. So very much to what you said, Matt, if your business is generating money and you're just building up a pile of cash, well, good for you, because that is not what I'm going to be doing. I move my money as soon as I can into areas that I feel comfortable with. Um, and that is that I've lost money and I've made money. And that is simple as that is what, what's the point in hoarding. So 
Um, my financial my financial lessons that I've seen and that I've benefited uh, you know benefited from, as many of you know, is I'm really I'm a big believer and thankfully because I believe I was brought up right with these morals is I've always had uh, what, what I call it my emergency fund. You can call it rainy day. I've had an emergency fund, and then I have a maintenance fund. So let me just explain the reason. And, and my pots now have doubled, if not tripled, during COVID because I've tightened down even more. Why do I have an emergency fund? Well, if everyone in my family needed funds to pay for everything, I have the money there. Why do I have a maintenance pot? And I know that Guy, Harley, Ben, other people, Vignes, who are my, you know, on my first group, the reason I have a maintenance pot is because if you have an emergency fund and you know, shit hits the fan and you use up that emergency fund, um, that was purely meant to be for your bills. That was for you to live, to buy food, to provide for your family. However, if something went wrong, like the dishwasher went, both cars went, uh, the cooker goes, how are you paying for that? You don't want to use your rainy day fund. Your rainy day is to live, to feed yourself. So that's why I have a maintenance fund, because if something goes down, I'm, my emergency fund is going to supply me and my family and the maintenance fund is purely to pay for the cooker, the MOT, the, the four cars that needs that, that blew out. So that's what I've been building on. So as soon as COVID hit, thank God, I had quite a large pot that I've always saved first and I never invested until my pots were large. So the lesson I'm basically getting at is here. I've seen a lot of people now that are financially struggling because what they wanted to do is they wanted to take a mere hundred pound and they wanted to invest the hundred pound to say that they were an investor. Um, everyone is an investor, but I, you know, let you know how many people are actually parting with their money. So, do the sensible thing. Obviously, debt's always to be clear. There is no advice by by me or Matt here. It's just our opinion. Start building up these safety nets, and then when you're comfortable, then start investing your money sensibly. Um, so I've seen real positives come out of that. I, I believe that I'm a positive show of that for me and my family, which I'm proud of, uh, but I've also seen it on the other side. So that is, is one of the biggest financial lessons is um, look after yourself first before you start going spending um, and investing money that actually isn't really investment money, because if you needed it back, uh, you know, you'd, you'd kind of be in a bit of a pickle. So that's one of the biggest ones. Uh, Matt, what's your take on money management just to finish on financial lessons how have you how do you ma manage uh, manage money and has anything changed yeah so really good points there by the way Alan I you know we going back to that thought like why is it that someone with say hundreds of thousands in the bank wouldn't feel the pinch to invest sadly there's only one reason you know and that is a lack of knowledge Right. The biggest the biggest expense in this current era is a lack of financial knowledge. It really is. It's because at the end of the day, if you know how to invest right, you can make more money by making your money multiply. I mean, look, if you bought a thousand, if you had, had awareness of Bitcoin, for, by the way, as an example, just to touch on it, back in 2010, you just put a thousand pounds into it. You have over a hundred million right now. Right. And that's, again, sadly, I didn't do that, right? But if I had, that's where we would be. Same with you. So you can't ever say that, you know, the, the biggest cost is financial knowledge, not cons and, and everyone's so focused on taking action, on, on doing work, on being busy in their businesses, putting fires out, that they never actually create space to think, to strategize, and to actually develop financial awareness. And so talking about money management now, back to your question, Alan, I think the big thing to realize is ultimately cash it really is trash especially today the reason i say that is because as, as soon as you're getting your money it's melting away like an ice cube think about your money as soon as you make money it is like an ice cube and if you're putting that into a bank account then it's it's got a heater over it and that out that ice cube is melting away and that's your value melting away and liquidated because of inflation and that's basically what is happening today. So every time you're receiving money, if you think about it as an ice cube, you would want to get it into a hard asset, into the freezer as soon as possible to preserve it, right? And also to grow it and to multiply it. So the, my mindset when it comes to money management is I want to double down on creating income, but then I want to make sure I multiply that, keep doubling down on that one source of income, and then take that money and put it somewhere else, like Aaron was saying, because if you're holding onto your money in a bank account today, 
the inflation rate is not the two, two and a half percent that the government presents to us. And here's why. The government selects which assets go into the inflation bucket. You can download these off the government's website. The, uh, if you just download the spreadsheets of RPI, retail price index, or CPI, consumer price index, they're two different baskets of assets and of things, consumables that you can buy. Not necessarily assets, but consumables. And so that's how they measure inflation. They look at how much bananas go up in a supermarket, right? They don't necessarily add things such as Bitcoin, gold, and silver and other things into the basket because they know that if they did that and people realized inflation was actually about 10 to 20% plus, people would probably be quite scared about the money in their bank account. And, you know, we'd start to actually have a shaky financial system. So it all rests with our own. We have to be aware of this and realize that money is going down and down in value the longer that we hold on to it and do nothing with it. And so the biggest expense right now, I believe in this era is financial, not having that financial awareness of what inflation really is and how government figures are all made up around the world. Real inflation is about 20 to 25%. I mean, if you measured inflation in Bitcoin terms, you've, you've basically got pummeled if Bitcoin becomes a global reserve currency in the future because Bitcoin's 5X basically year on year. Uh, so, if you look back to the dip last year, in fact, it's 10x. It's basically 10x since February, March time, right? And so if you're not capturing growth in the right assets, your money is going down and down in value. Your purchasing power is going down and down in value. And it becomes harder and harder to get into other things over time because the price will keep escaping it. So when it comes to money management, that's my plan. I want to create income. I want to double down on that source of income and not get distracted. This is something that I did in my early uh, when I was making sales as a teenager and all the rest of it, right, I'd get distracted. I was like, I want to just make some money and figure things out. And early on in business, this is what it's like. We have too many shiny objects. We go for everything and then we don't make any of them excellent. Mm -hmm. My focus now as a business owner is always making something excellent, doubling down on it, becoming great at it, even if I'm not good at it at the start. And then that income source can keep growing and then be multiplied in assets over time. But I don't want to just hold money in a bank account, especially in a business bank account. You want to be drawing down profits or reinvesting in the marketing and the growth potential of your business. If you're sitting on cash right now, you really want to think about how you can manage that safely. Because if you hold $200,000 in a bank account, for example, right now, by the end of this year, you'll have lost 20 to 25% of that purchasing power. And, and so that's an easy win. Just start learning about investing and diversifying. Uh, similarly to Aaron, I'd always, firstly, I look at it a bit like a waterfall. The first thing is, obviously, pay off your debts. Clear your debts. That's the first goal, uh, ideally, typically. Uh, but the second thing as well is you want to have six months, ideally, of, of savings yeah. so that you've got them in a high liquid account, even if it's in something else that's liquid. It's actually a minor investment with a low return. But then you start to look at the other options, right? You start to look at the portfolio assets and everything else. But people often try to jump before they've got their own basis set. And I think that's a really important thing to realize. Until we get our basis set, we shouldn't be going off and diverting our attention into other things because you've got to get that sound financial stability so that you're not in anxiety, you're not in that scarcity mode. And, and you have freedom to actually go into your business with more confidence. Yeah, I totally agree. And, you know, you do have you have a sense of calm. It, you, you know, you take sort of a step back when you've got your backing of like your emergency fund and a bit of maintenance there. You make clearer decisions. You're not rushed into thinking, oh, I've got to make money now. But just um, just to understand everyone on the call who has for their income and that money comes in, who has everything set up on a standing order before they're paid by putting a Y for yes or an N for no in the chat? just so you can get an idea how many people have everything on a standing order, because that's just bare basics. Um, yeah, cool. Okay, so yes, yeah, so I, haven't, I haven't seen one no yet, which is good. Okay, so that's- not, Yeah, not many. It's a very strong group, Alan. Well trained. Yeah, oh, we've, got, we've, we've, got, we've got one, but- it, it's, su it's such a it's such a basic thing to do is standing order and and I, I put out a reel um, not too long ago just to close off this topic is the only difference you know everyone on here 
is no different from anyone else. Like there is nothing special about Matt, about me, about Drew, about James, Daniel, uh, Aisha, Sarah, n- nothing. Like we, we are completely all the same. We all wake up, we all need the toilet, we all bleed, everything like that. The only difference is, is I truly believe is discipline and how early you can start discipline. Imagine if everyone had like this uh, r- regimented routine from the age of like 18. I mean, Guy and Harley, are who, who are on the call now, I, I've, I've predicted by 30, they'll be multimillionaires. Um, and I reckon that they will be um, because they started in my group at 17 years old. And I, d- I do not know other than those two who's, who started um, at 17 years old. I mean, I used to sell penny sweets at school. I'm sure a few other people did, but that was about it. Um, so, you know, stuff like that, it's, um, it's, it's purely discipline. That's what separates people. So in regards to money management, there is no reason, whatever financial situation you're in, whether you save a pound a week or a hundred pound a week, everyone can do it. It's as simple as that. So money management to finish on there, a final financial lesson is, um, is to really get your finances structured. Um, everyone can do it. There's no excuse. So jumping over to topic two, and that's about adapting. So obviously we all know that some businesses adapted. Just a prime example, I think, what was it, Matt? There was home base and B&Q on the first lockdown. One of them did like pickup delivery and home base. I think it was home base that didn't and B&Q did. I can't remember what one it was. But anyway, they adapted. One got more business at one point than the other did. So that's just a very simple example. Um, Matt, what cases have you seen, good and bad, of businesses that even or even, you know, personally um, should have adapted and perhaps people that didn't adapt and what are the results of that? Yeah, great question. And I'd love to know in the chat as well, any others here who feel like they had to make a major pivot at the start of the uh, at the start of, you know, the, the dip last year, right? The, the lockdowns back in February, March time and everyone was panicking back in the UK. Um, I think the biggest thing, though, that we've realized right now is we've all got to be online in some way or we're irrelevant, you know, especially right now. There's another lockdown. I know in the UK, I'm locked down here in Montreal. Flights are grounded Canada to the the UK, so I couldn't get back to the UK as I wanted to, ideally, between Christmas and New Year. So, you know, I had to pivot because of that. Right. And I've got some property projects on the ground in Cardiff that I wanted to go over to uh, just for the completion, which is coming up in February, March time. But uh, reality is we all have to pivot and adjust and not let our emotions get out of the game. Right. There's there's two responses that we can have. We can either observe it and, and see it for what it is and then take action or we can get emotionally frozen because we react to it. We get we get really hacked off. Right. And we get frozen. And so there's so many times when I've seen, you know, multiple business owners just getting caught out with their emotions in the past 12 months. And I think as entrepreneurs and as business owners, we just have to focus on what really is real. We have to be realists at times and not get caught up in the fact that things may go back to normal when we're not in control of that, right? We're not in control of that. This is a new normal, as I think a lot of us now realize with this second wave and everything that's going on around us. And, you know, I think from a business standpoint, we had to become, you know, look at how quickly you acted right now. Think back to March last year. Did you act quickly? Was there a delay? Are you maybe looking to pivot more right now? Because this is like a second, you know, knock at the door that, hey, you've got to take action and and move now. And often that comes back to our emotional acuity as entrepreneurs and business people. And I think that's the biggest thing that right now we have to have is that have that create that space in your life to think about things strategically and to not get caught up in the doing, doing, doing. There's a number of property developers, for example, who I know who were in deep trouble when the lockdown hit because they had too much debt. They had too much debt. They suddenly realized they had to freeze their developments because they weren't allowed contractors on site. And they were very concerned that they were going to lose their assets. And if it wasn't for the government support that came out, they would be under right now. And some of these are very big names, by the way, that I think, you know, without saying names, a lot of us would know them in the property space. They're people who, you know, reputable companies, right? But they had too much debt. And so what we've realized is that I think in these times, it's, it's like the tide goes out and you start to realize who's been swimming naked, 
all along, yeah. you know? Yeah. And so for me, the big pivot that I've made is doubling down on what I can do online. So in my real estate business, I've been creating a, effectively an iBuyer platform to match buyers with sellers, as I'm extremely bullish on the disruption of the real estate space going forwards and the real estate agency space. If you look at Open Door in the USA right now, okay, real estate agents are not going to exist in their current form for much longer because Open Door and other blockchain companies as well and tokenization of real estate, that's going to bring together the buyers and sellers from peer to peer in the same way that money's being disrupted with Bitcoin right now. You're going to have peer to peer transactions in real estate and they'll be facilitated online where the buyer and the seller can directly get in touch. There's no agent involved and suddenly you cut out the middleman and the fees are a lot less, right? So, so that's one area, for example, that I've been pivoting on. Another area is just doubling down on my, the reallocation of my portfolio, understanding that real estate was probably going to get hit because of what's going on now with the commercial office spaces all empty around the UK and around the world. And just making sure I'm prepared for that and I'm not sitting on too much debt with the portfolio of properties and also that I'm focused on buying and holding. I'm not buying and selling any properties right now because that is a gamble. If you're buying and selling, with the, if your profits are locked up in a flip right now and the market tanks in the next month or two, you're screwed. Yeah. And so you may get lucky, but that's not a game that I play. So everything now is buy and hold in the real estate side. And it had been, to be honest, going into this recession as I, I felt it was on its way. And then secondly, I'd go on to that focus on the online business in terms of the community that I'm looking to build as well and, and help more people to strategically build wealth in this time. Right? This is the time for us all to connect online in these kind of environments. And that's what's been really powerful for me over the past six to 12 months. Yeah. And do you know what? You've just hit the nail on the head is that is not to be. And I said it earlier is not to be that one sort of trick pony where, you know, if you're in property um, and I know there's a lot of property people on here, but this is just my views, not necessarily your views. But do I love property? The real answer is no. Um, do I get excited about seeing it? No. Um, is there anything that fires up in my belly? No. What does it do, though? It makes money. Um, I like money and I'm sure everyone else on here likes money. So but. You know, if, like you said, Matt, and I know, I know firsthand some developers as well who have, who are really struggling and are in a bit of a pickle um, because they had too much debt and they were focused on one thing. Whereas I know developers who are multi-asset backed and what that means is they have commercial, they have retail, they have long lease, um, they have uh, sites that they purely buy off the, the land bank. They buy dirt cheap, they put in planning and then they sell it. And they're extremely financially liquid. But the one who was just a developer through and through, very black and white, just a developer, took on a lot of debt. Um, great when times were good. But the problem is they've got no other assets. They, they don't, they're not really educated in any other space. They haven't got a secondary business that generates money. They were a property developer through and through. And now they're in a bit of a pickle because they're like, oh, you know, I owe, um, I know, I owe a private bank 1.2 million and I cannot pay it back. And that bank wants it back yesterday. So I also know some developers who are struggling. So the point of that is don't, you know, if you love property, great, crack on with that. But it might be worth spending a few hours every week about learning about the stock market, learning about Bitcoin, learning about starting um, social media. You know, social media, I, I, I think I was on the call with Paul and Sam Norris. There's a lot of old terminology. So uh, I'm going to ask someone. Um, I'm going to ask two people. I'm going to ask Shane and I'm going to ask Ben. When you hear the word business, uh, Shane, I'll start with you. When you hear the word business, what do you actually think of? The first three things that come to your head. If I said, Shane, you've got to start a business, what is the first thing that comes into your head? Uh, that I need like uh, an office. Yeah. Big office. Uh, lots of people working for me. Yeah. And i uh, going to wear a suit and tie. Yeah. Ben? Yeah, mine was going to be, well, the one about the suit and tie. Um, hard work and um, oh, um, can't think of a third one. Yeah, it's a limited company, uh, office supplies, you've got to go out and buy it all. Th that word, business should be thrown in the bin because starting an Instagram page and structuring it, which is a call that I covered with my, my secondary group, social media is your business. It can be in your personal name. That is your business. But the word business puts a lot of people off. So you need to have a secondary. What can earn income? 
uh, Instagram can earn income. If you've got a consultancy or you're, you've got a profession or you, you know, you, you're knowledgeable in an area, start a business on that through social media. Do something online, like Max said, offer the other service. Um, you know, property is great and I'm not digging at property here. I'm just trying to get through to you that social media is an income. You know, it's not vanity anymore. There are people out there that just constantly pose for it and that's all great. But what's the purpose? So, you know, I have a, I have a very clear plan of what my social media page is doing. No one else will know, but I know that Instagram will one day earn me a lot of money. Basically, that's what I'm saying. So, I'm, you know, I'm saying that and I, I want everyone else to say that. But it's an income. I'm not looking at it as its Instagram social media page. It will earn me an income. Um, and it's got to be the same for you. So old wording puts a lot of people off. So starting a business and having a secondary income doesn't have to mean office. You know, I work out of a cabin, which I call my office. I've got no overheads. It's fantastic. So creating an ebook, starting a YouTube channel, uh, starting a blog page, whatever it is, you know, generating other incomes when times are hard through the property market or the stock market. Just try not to be a one trick pony is, is what I'm basically getting at. So I don't know what your thoughts are on that, Matt. That's a great share. Uh, you know, I think I definitely resonate with, with all you're saying, Aaron, around social media. I think, as you say, it's a tool. Yeah. We've got to, we've got to be intentional about why we're using it. You know, it can be a tool for basically mindlessly wasting hours and hours a day scrolling and looking at everyone else's shopping window and not building your own life, right? Yeah. And just well, seeing their best fits. Or you can use it strategically and connect with the right people who you learn and grow from and actually build traffic that find value from what you're sharing. And so I think we're really in an era right now where everyone, we all should really decide where do we want to go deep for the next decade? Right. The, the world has slowed down the last year. And I know a lot of us have realized this, especially with working from home. And maybe you're not used to that for a lot of us who have come to the corporate world. And maybe even if you had a business and you were running a team, you realize now people can work from home. We're moving to a world which is a lot more purposeful, I believe, because at the end of the day, people don't feel the chains of their previous employer so much now because they realize that they can get fired and that furloughed effectively means fired later for a lot of people in the UK, sadly, right? So there's this big realization that actually an employer is not necessarily as reliable as they previously thought because they've seen so many people get fired. So now there's this big, I feel, uprising almost, which is mobility and entrepreneurship. I believe that online entrepreneurship is going to grow exponentially in the coming decade. Yeah, and for all of us, you know, we can all generate an income stream online right now. You've just got to decide what area of expertise would energize you the most. What area do you want to dominate? I know there's a bunch of people on it. For example, Graham, who I see, good to see you, mate. I know that you're massively passionate about the fitness space, for example. And I know you've got multiple business things that you've looked at in that space as well as property, right? But now that's the thing is we have full permission to go out there and pursue our purpose and to go deep on dominating our space, dominating our niche. So think about... What area would you love to just go deep in and dominate for the next decade? This is not about a short-term thing because when you think over the long term, that's when you give yourself potential to stay in the game. Most people quit because they're building a life that's based upon the next 12 months. And what Aaron just shared is how he's talking about Instagram as an asset that will pay him into the future because he's going to go deep in his niche. And I think that is really critical for us all to realize is we've got these tools available Now's the chance to really harness them in the right way and, and also do value-driven content. Give so much value away that it becomes ridiculous. Think about what yeah. people would normally pay you for and give it away online. Because if you can lower the free value right now, you'll build up so much trust versus yeah. everyone else who's just trying to sell stuff online rather than build value, build value online and then capture people because they're building a magnetic marketing campaign. And that's the power right now is you don't have to sell hard online to get a massive amount of people reaching out to you for more information. I tell you, this is a subject, right? We will move on, but this is a subject I really go on. And what I just want to finish on here is um, I'm going to point towards Guy and Harley again. But when, when people think of Guy and Harley, what's the first thing? The blue comes into your head and the property sourcing. Now, another five years from now, Guy and Harley, let's just say you start buying your own property. I'm going to use you as a, a good example. If you start buying your own property and it went extremely wrong and the market dipped, what do you have to fall back on? You could have brand deals. Uh, you could have 
uh, property sourcing that will still run ahead. You'll probably have other incomes through social media, but don't call it so it's social media slash business. It's social media, yeah, because that's what the first title it was given, but it's actually a business platform. It is an asset. So that's that I use them as a good example because they've got their branding very well. And it's the same for Tej Talks. If Tej's portfolio went down, I'm sure Tej in his own time will get a brand deal for something. He'll get a new uh, sourcing app that will contact him and say, we'll pay you X amount a month if you post X amount of posts about our app. So that's that's the opportunity. And when I say this, I really mean it because I see the vision. I know, Matt, you see it as well. And I had a conversation yesterday with someone about this. It's so easy and there's too much opportunity to earn money online. It just takes consistency and you've got to have a real vision and you've got to have a plan. There's no point going, I'm going to do uh, Instagram. I'm going to do LinkedIn. I'm going to do YouTube. I'm going to do my business. I'm going to do everything. But you have no idea actually really the inner workings of how you're going to tie it all in and compound it just like you would investing. It all needs to tie in and you need to have like a center product and you need to be that brand. So it is too easy to earn a lot of money on Instagram, um, but you have to, just like Lewis says, you have to show up every day. Um, but obviously we do need breaks of social media because at the moment um, I'm probably coming up to my period of like, I just need to have a break of it, you know, because you do, you end up getting sick of it. But that's but important. That's the thinking time. Really though. important. Yeah, yeah. r and is so important. So um, have a plan, but, you know, see the opportunities online because there is a lot of opportunity to earn uh, money online. Okay, let's move on to topic three. So, um, Matt, if, if it's okay, I don't mind kicking this one off um, to see what your thoughts are. F fire it out there. And that's the banking system. So, just by a nod of heads, or you can put a little yes or a no, who has had most recently on their, uh, well, whoever you bank with, on your app, does it ever come up and say, link in another bank account so we can help you identify your spending habits. You know, where one one of your banks that you're with wants you to link up with another one, just by a show of heads or why, little nod of heads. Yeah, okay, I'm not buying into any of that. Do I want to show my other banks what I'm spending and just give everyone visibility? I'd be, it'd be absolutely nuts for me to go, yeah, 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 all my banks, don't worry, you can see exactly what I'm spending um, and you can have full control and visibility over what I'm spending. It's absolutely bonkers. There is no chance um, I will ever be showing every single bank what I'm spending because that is, that is call it what you want. A lot of people go, oh, it's a conspiracy, whatever. But it is what it is. I don't like it. Um, so that is something just to keep an eye out for. One other thing that I do believe will happen if you hold large amounts of money in the bank, I really do believe this, is that there will be clauses at some point. And this is why... I'm not a big believer in holding large amounts of money in the bank is because how long will it take for the bank to turn around and say, okay, you want to withdraw 5,000 pounds. Okay. Obviously you have to provide ID, stuff like that. However, we're going to need you to provide a reason to what you're actually spending that on. So where, when do we actually get to the point where the bank starts bringing in clauses when really the underlying problem is, is that the money's not there too much has been printed and they're basically being told now, um, you can't be dishing out everyone £5,000. We just haven't got it. So we're going to need to put in clauses for them to justify. They're going to need to bring in proof of ID. They're going to need to bring in this. They're going to need to draw down in segments. They can't have the full 20K. You can come in and you can get 2000 every month. I'm not saying that's going to happen. I'm just saying that I'm not prepared to leave huge chunks of money in the bank to the point where they go, we haven't actually got it. The whole green got vault thing doesn't really exist. Um, really sorry, your money isn't as safe as what we think. And by the way, we're going to have to dip into your pension. Call me um, what you want, but that's that's my beliefs. And that's why I make, uh, I believe, good financial decisions where I pump it out all the time and I hold very little and I'm a big, obviously, gold investor. So, Matt, what is your views on the banking system? What do you like about them or what don't you like about them? Um, yeah, fire away. Yeah. So interesting topic, and I can see there's a lot of uh, opinions as well in the chat, which is which is funny. Um, when it comes, yeah, when it comes to the banking system today, I just think it's it's funny how we are still tolerating in 2021 a system which is open nine till five Monday to Friday yeah. to handle your money. Right? You know, you send a transaction on the weekend; it's probably not reaching the other person till the Monday maybe Tuesday, it's closed on bank holidays, right? It's closed on the weekends. So I, I just think at the end of the day, the critical thing that happened recently 
is that the reserve ratio of the banks went from 10% down to 5%, down to basically zero. Because now the, get, now the banks can create money out of thin air with no, no assets, on, you yeah. know, no cash on, on deposit. Because guess what? They've got bailout packages and approvals from the government to go print them and to go print like crazy. You know? So the challenge that we have right now is that this is totally unprecedented. We've never been in a situation where the banks have held less reserves versus the money that they're lending out than now. That's the thing that we have to all realize. Your money in a bank right now is not your legal ownership. It is the bank that owns your money, not you. This is something that most of us don't know because we're just taught, save your money, save your money, save it for a rainy day, just save your money in a bank. That's all we're taught at school. Save as much money as you can and you'll do well, right? They don't teach you to invest. They don't tell you that the bank's the one who owns your money. <laughs> Maybe if they did, we would actually behave differently and start learning about investing at a young age. Sadly, the system is somewhat rigged against us because Wall Street and the city of London makes a ton of money out of the management of your money. So when you're giving somebody else control of your money and control of your wealth, control of your life's force, in effect, your energy, that's what money really is. It's your energy stored in currency because effectively that's what you receive money for, right? Add value to the marketplace. You collect that and store energy money, which is then transferable to other things. So when we're giving that responsibility to the banking sector, the challenge is you only have access to it nine to five, Monday to Friday. You don't have access to it on weekends or bank holidays. Plus you're giving over legal ownership to somebody who doesn't have a positive financial management history because what they've done is they've continuously depleted the amount of money that they're holding on, on hand and raise the amount that they lend out. Now, whether it's the governments or whether it's the central banks, whether it's the actual financial institutions themselves, we just have to realize that more money is being printed than ever before. And so what that means is when more money gets added to the system and the banks are the ones, think about it. Those of you who may have applied for bounce back loans, where did you go to get them? You went to the bank. The bank just added more money in the, in the, in the, in the credit column of its balance sheet, right? You, you owe the bank money. That's basically what happens. And there were no reserves held for the money that were added. And that's the environment that we're in right now. It's just completely unprecedented and it could lead to dramatic inflation. And I'm not saying that, you know, the pound, the US dollar, the euro, the yen, I do believe will be phased out at some point. Mm -hmm. The question is, will this lead to hyperinflation because of this, this very irresponsible behavior whereby if you go to the bank today to get your money, it could take you days to get the money because the bank doesn't have the money. If everyone went to a bank right now to ask for their money, they've got less than 5% of the money available because now they're printing out of thin air. When it was 10%, effectively that meant if you went to the bank and you deposited 10,000 pounds, the bank could lend out 100,000 pounds against the 10,000 pounds. That was already ludicrous enough, surely, right? Yeah. Because you, if you do the maths, if enough people go back and, and ask for their money, over 10% of people ask for money, it's not there. And it creates this panic situation. But the only reason why the banking system still operates today is because not enough people have lost trust with the banks. And therefore, it's propped up with the fact that, you know, we still trust them to hold our money. And if enough people went to the banks and asked for their money, just as they did in Cyprus in 2012 to 13, the banks would have a lockup. Effectively, there'd be a bailing of your funds. So your money would be frozen. You wouldn't be able to spend it. And in Cyprus, what happened is the savers, the pension holders, everyone who had a bunch of money in the bank, they lost 50% above a certain amount. I think it was 80,000 euros. They lost, they lost 50% to basically pay back the government. I think it may have even been 60% to have some Cypriot friends who this happened to their family. They lost all of their money. It went back to the government to pay out the government. And then they reopened the banks two weeks later. So finally you could access your money. But guess what? You could only access 100 euros or 1,000 euros a week. You couldn't even pull out everything else. So that is the situation that we're facing right now. I believe what could lead to other forms of currency going parabolic in price, when you're measuring them in pounds, euros, yen, dollars, is that situation happening in a Western country, whether it's the UK. If that happens to a UK bank, it would be catastrophic for the pound. Yeah. It would it'd be absolutely dead. And same thing, it could happen in the Eurozone. My prediction is it will probably happen in the Eurozone to the likes of, say, a German bank, but probably a Spanish or Italian bank on the fringes. 
when one of those collapses and it happens in the Western world, you're going to see a, you're just going to see people panicking and trying to get their money out of the bank as fast as possible. Yeah. And so that's really where I am on the system today. I believe we're going through a huge transition, which is going to take us to a far better future. But in the meantime, there's a lot of turbulence. And so we've got to be prepared for that. I think also a lot of the money that still supports the banking system is old money. I think when the new money sort of starts to rise and people do become financially aware, which across the board, they don't really want too many be people becoming financially aware because if, imagine if everyone was multimillionaires and self-employed and CEOs and running their own businesses, the bank would have no money, there'd be no pensions, the government would run, it'd all be a nightmare. But just to finish on that, what I do want to say, and this is just food for thought and, you know, and go away and do your own thinking about it, but has anyone just by sort of a nod of head again, has anyone ever heard that, you know, eventually they want to get rid of all cash, as in physical cash. Has anyone ever heard that, that really, because there's no control over physical cash, you can't monitor physical cash. Okay, so if you have heard that, okay, and you ask uh, perhaps the older generation or stuff like that, and you say, you know, eventually they want to get rid of cash. What's the, what's the likely thing that they turn around and say, oh, don't be so silly. Oh, you listen to too much news. Look what's happened during COVID. Who's been using cash? You've been what, 2% using cash, 3%? It's already happening. They do not want you to have cash. We've not been using cash. Why? Because you can't monitor cash. You know, you can't anymore go in and, and to a car dealer and pay for cash. If you pay for, what is it, over 7,500, the bank man the, the, the manager of the storeroom has to contact the bank. No, it's my money. Okay, I'm not a drug dealer. I've come here to pay with cash. You don't need to call anyone, sit down and finish my car, my car deal. But no, they have to go, I'm sorry, sir, you might be dodgy. You've got loads of tattoos. I'd be screwed. And then they'd be calling the bank uh, and saying, what's Aaron doing with this cash? So that's kind of the situation, right? So if you don't believe it, well, go and check it out. But that's my view. Cash is already pretty much on its way out. But we have to find a balance because I also hold cash because if I want, you know, some of my maintenance is cash, but some of my maintenance is also in the, in the bank. Um, but it's being diversified. Also spread across multiple banks. Anyone who holds one bank account, more for you. I don't mean that in a rude way, but more for you because you need to spread um, across multiple banks. I have six bank accounts. I'm very happy with that. I mitigate my risk. So that is something. And then just finally, uh, I think someone put it on here. I think it was Aisha and someone else might have said it. But I, when I went to draw down, I think it was something like four and a half thousand pounds. I went looking a little bit scruffy. Um, I, I literally just dived on in the bank and, you know, all tattoos on show and everything like that. And I was rushing and I just said, look, I need to withdraw this amount of money. And I transferred instantly some money from one bank to the other because the other bank had a uh, the queue was like a mile long. I was not waiting in the rain. So I went to this other bank. And she leant over to me and she said, um, oh, have you just transferred this money? And I said, yeah. And she said, oh, OK, just just one moment. And she leant over and she looked at someone else and then she said, uh, what, are, what are you doing with, with the money? And I said, excuse me. And she said, well, what, what's the money for? And I said, well, that's none of your business. And she said, oh, no, no, I was just making general chit chat. And I actually said to her, no, general chit chat. You ask me how the weather is. You don't ask me what I'm spending my own money on. And I've now left that bank. I'm not with that bank. Don't don't question me on my own money. Like, I get really irate about it. Anyway, let's move on. Um, so storage of wealth. Matt, how are you storing wealth at the moment? What's an alternative? Um, you know, where's your money going as a storage? Not an investment, but a storage, a safer option. Yeah. Um, I can see the chat, by the way. Keep the chat going, people, because I'm reading it throughout. It's really interesting to see all of the comments come through. And uh, I saw Seb as well. Seb was saying how... There's, there's countries that have phased out cash right now. Yeah, that's true. You know, there are countries, I mean, Venezuela right now, you couldn't pay in cash if you tried because the currency is hyperinflated. So you'd be taking wheelbarrows to get a loaf of bread, just like the Germans did, unfortunately, back in Weimar Republic. Right? That's basically what's happened to Venezuela is they, they had inflation of 16,000% back in 2019. I don't think they've, they've announced what it was last year yet. Uh, it's probably even worse than that. That's 160x, by the way. That means... You know, imagine the price of the purchasing power going down by that much or the price of goods and services anyway in a year. So that's the reality facing some of these emerging countries. Nigeria is another country which has struggled. Turkey, we've been hearing about recently. You know, I know they fired their central bankers. So with that in mind, we have to have this plan to store our wealth right now. 
And so this is when it goes back to really looking at the waterfall effect, looking at where different things are. Firstly, obviously you want to have it, have you want to focus on getting yourself to financial stability. And if you have expensive debts, that is an easy win because typically credit card debt, as an example, is a 20% interest rate per year. Okay, so if it's not on a zero rate agreement, for example, you should figure out how to pay that off. If it is on a zero rate agreement, then maybe you want to go and build wealth somewhere and then pay it off. It's up to you, right? Because I, I understand there's different strategies with credit cards and using debt wisely for assets. But you want to really reduce any expensive debts and obligations that you've got. And then you also want to make sure that you've got a bit of a buffer. And as you say, Aaron, have it stored in different accounts. But that should be very little. I mean, for me, yeah. I'm... I personally, my comfort point, I don't need any cash really. I like very little cash because I focus on bringing more in. And when I get my cash out into other things, it forces me to, to hustle and grind and to push and to have my back against the wall. And that's when I produce my best results. And maybe that's the situation for a number of us, by the way, as well, is that we're better at creating results when our back's against the wall. So actually, getting the cash out your bank, cash is there as a comfort mechanism for too many people. And that is actually what's hindering your growth. You are hindering your growth because you're holding too much cash in the bank and you're just getting too comfy. You're getting too comfy, you're taking it easy, you know you've got reserves in the bank and that's what's forcing you to, that's what's uh, stopping you from getting to that next level of abundance and potential in your life. That might be it. So for me, I look at collecting as much cash as I can, growing the businesses, and then reinvesting that into my assets. So when I'm looking at assets, what do I look at? I look at things that are longer term investments, less liquid investments, such as real estate. Maybe you're looking at storing currency though as well. So going firstly to currencies, you wanna have some money maybe in gold, silver, and Bitcoin. And again, this isn't financial advice, but what I look at is firstly, what are the currencies that are available? And even before that, if you just hold British pounds right now, you want to be thinking about how can you hold some euros and some dollars and diversify your forex? Because if you just have one bank account, I mean, in the UK, you can open up a Revolut bank account, for example, and it's multi-currency. Revolut are generally pretty good, although I have been let down recently by their customer service, I'll be honest with you. Um, but you should have access to a multi-currency account so that you can hedge your cash. And then you should think about, right, where else can I put this? Gold, silver, Bitcoin are more stable forms of wealth preservation as we look at history in the past. History shows us that Bitcoin has outperformed every other asset class on average for the last 10 to 11 years. Result, you know, history is there. It is in history. That, that can't be disputed. So Bitcoin has shown us that it's a far more stable form of value storage than and purchasing power storage than the pound, the dollar, and everything else that's been collapsing in Bitcoin terms. Similarly, with gold and silver, we've seen price gains last year, although some of those were retraced. And I know there's a recent bit of a trace pullback uh, when I last looked today. But long term, I'm very bullish on what's going to happen with gold and silver because we're ultimately moving to a new financial system and a new economic world order. And if you want the book on it, in fact, I've got it on my desk here. You want to read this book, The Great Reset, by Klaus Schwab and Thierry Malouet. It's a COVID-19, The Great Reset. That basically tells you exactly what is going on and exactly what's being planned and effectively is strategically being carried out right now. And you want to get into the minds of the system, what is being done by the machine that's in operation right now. And that's the thing. And when you do that, you can figure out where you store your currency, and safely allocate it into different asset classes. And then, so my goal right now in general terms is basically explode my purchasing power with gold, silver, Bitcoin, especially Bitcoin. I'm very bullish on Bitcoin and remain so and have been, you know, I first had Bitcoin in 2011, 2012 when I was trading it in the CAD labs at university. I just wish that I flipping held it back then when it was sub hundred dollars. And no one knew what it was back then. That's what you've got to realize. Nobody had a clue what it was even going to end up being. People thought, is it digital cash? What's going to happen? Now it's, we all understand how its scarcity of supply is, is looking to add a store of value, just like digital gold. And then, in the same time, I'm focused on cash flow assets in the form of real estate that I'm not looking to sell at any time soon. Because I know the real estate sector is going to take a crash at some point in the near future. 
So you've got to be careful when buying real estate. It's not to say that deals can't happen because it's all about the deal itself. But my goal right now is explode the purchasing power with stores of value because the next few years are very bullish for Bitcoin, gold, and silver for the reasons talked about, the inflation that's going on. And this isn't financial advice. This is what I'm doing and you can take it or leave it. And then secondly, my plan in the long term is to acquire a bunch of real assets, a bunch of real estate, cash flow assets, and step hard into the build to rent space because the demand for rental accommodation, talk about COVID triggers, everyone now wants to rent rather than own because they don't want obligation of a mortgage. They, mm -hmm. They've lost their jobs and they can't afford to buy a house anymore because their deposits are getting wiped out as they've had to use that cash to live. So that's the big picture of what I'm seeing right now. And yeah, I'd love to hear your strategy, Aaron, as well. Yeah. So, I mean, you hit some like really good points there, Matt. And I mean, with, with storage of wealth, also it's timing, like you said, you know, it might not be the right time for property. It might not be the right time for this. I mean, with Bitcoin at the moment, you know, certainly for me, when I put some money into Bitcoin, it's going to be on the next drop. Um, you know, I'm no expert on Bitcoin. I know Matt uh, sort of deals in, in that space a lot more. However, as many of you, you know, have followed me for however long, know that I'm a big gold investor. My family of uh, are gold investors. Uh, so my knowledge is within gold. I, I understand the model of gold and I understand its history. And look, just to give you a bit of an idea, if you'd have bought $1,000 worth of gold in 1918, now it'd be worth over $80,000. So that's kind of, you know, and, and history doesn't lie. Whereas Bitcoin at the moment, you know, still developing its history. But for storage, I think when people buy gold, there's a difference. You, you need to understand gold is dead money. So when you buy it, don't expect to do anything other than touch it and look at it if you've got the physical bar and enjoy the actual bar itself. That, that's the only purpose it serves. You know, so it's purely storage of wealth. So, for example, if you had £30,000 sitting in the bank, would you want all 30000 me personally, no, I'd probably want maybe 10,000 tops. The rest, 20,000 would probably be in gold if I'm storing it. Why? Because the gold will beat the bank regardless. And let's say something dramatic happens um, and I've got 20K in gold. Okay, that's a, that'd a lot, be a lot of gold to hold. Um, you know, there is some risk there. Um, it would need to be stored correctly or however you end up storing it. So there is that slight risk there but anyway you're storing it correctly and you think to yourself well i've got 20 20 grand of gold and there is a complete change in currency or the banks just shut down and they're like right you can't get your 10 grand now because we're we're changing things there's new clauses whatever happens well guess what Bit, uh, gold you can exchange into bitcoin gold you could turn into euros gold you could go and exchange for 100 cows and a few donkeys and a couple of chickens you can still do that will we ever probably get to that stage probably not but if I did get to that stage, well, guess what? I can go do that. Uh, if my money was in the bank, could I go do that? No, because now I am uh, I'm mercy uh, at the bank, basically, and what they do. So gold should be seen as dead money. It is storage. Will I beat the bank? Yes. Go look at a chart. Look at the chart over the last hundred years of gold. It still is value. Um, you know, it doesn't deteriorate. It doesn't break down gold. You know, and the thing with gold, there's this there's an actual demand for it. So some people might say, well, you know, it's an old way to look at it, gold, but there's still retail, there's still consumer goods, uh, there's demand for gold. So gold will always have a purpose and they don't really know how much gold left is to be mined. So that gives it value because that holds rarity. We're losing all of that and we've touched on it. And just to finish on it, we are losing the value of fiat currency. So um, go check it out, do your own research. You know, what me and Matt invest in um, is again, not financial advice, it's what we do. So Matt, let's wrap that one up. Let's jump on to the final topic, just because of time. I think most people are happy to stay on another 10 minutes. Um, future money, what, um, let, let's talk a bit about Bitcoin. Let's talk about um, perhaps, does gold hold an actual purpose, you know, in regards to actually using it in the future or what is the future money? So I think a big thing to think about here is time horizon. I think that the next 10 years will be very strong for Bitcoin, gold, and silver. I think at some point, though, there emerges a winner. And I think my bet personally is on Bitcoin being the winner long term. And here's why. The reason why is there's a critical thing that we realize with the birth of Bitcoin. And it's akin to the creation of the number zero. Bitcoin cannot be replicated. 
it's people have tried to do that throughout the last 12 years you cannot replicate bitcoin and succeed because of the brand name and because of the concept of digital scarcity which it sold and because of the network effect as this thing keeps building more and more momentum and there's a reason why the big players the fund managers the hedge funds are entering bitcoin and not the other cryptocurrencies it's because they understand the problem that bitcoin solves Whereas a lot of the others are ultimately, yes, they will go up in price at some point, no doubt. They'll also dump a lot. Uh, and a lot of them are unproven concepts. But with Bitcoin, we've effectively solved the problem of digital scarcity. There's only 21 million Bitcoin to ever be minted on the planet. We'll finish minting them around 21, I think it's around the year 2135, something like that. Okay, so it's going to be over 100 years until we get to that point. But right now, you're already at about 18.3 or 18.4 million, I believe it is, I'd have to check again, in terms of current circulation, right, that have been mined already. So we're already so far up the curve in terms of supply to the system that there's not much left to go around for the rest of the people. And the critical difference between Bitcoin and gold and silver is ultimately that we know how much there is in circulation at any one time, to the, to the decimal. We know exactly how much Bitcoin there is in circulation that has been minted. We also know how much there will be ever minted in the future. The challenge with gold and silver is this. We can estimate mining deposits, but we don't know for sure. And Elon is looking to mine asteroids for precious metals. If he does that, what impact could that have on the gold price? Right? And just remember, 10 years ago, it was people thought we were crazy to, to be thinking about autonomous driving cars. It's already happened. 10 years time, what's going to happen? We'll probably be mining asteroids for gold and silver. So when that happens and we have a supply surge, it's classic supply and demand playing out, whereby the value of gold and silver may come down because suddenly we have a lot more of it available to humanity. So think about that, right? And so there's all of these different things that we have to think about when it comes to a best form of money, best form of ultimately store value. And that's what Bitcoin is. You don't need to use it as cash because that can be a layer two protocol effectively, a derivative of that. So when I look at, when I look at the current cryptocurrency uh, ecosystem, Bitcoin is just like digital gold, if you wanna think about it like that, right? It has solved the challenge of digital scarcity that was never solved ever in history. It's akin to the creation of the number zero, I believe. And buying Bitcoin today is a bit like buying a piece of the internet. It's not like a company. It is like buying a piece of a network that's growing, that's expanding, and it's going to truly change the world. That's what I believe we are buying into when we own a piece of the Bitcoin network, which you do by just having Bitcoin. You are supporting the network by putting your money into the network and showing that that's where you want to store wealth. And as the network keeps growing, I believe it, it, you know, the price in the future is effectively infinite if fiat currencies collapse and we have hyperinflation and everything else because it's worthless, right? If fiat currencies become worthless, people ask me how, how high can Bitcoin go? It could be infinite because it, we're using the wrong measuring stick. Everyone's trying to measure things in US dollars. What you want to look at is relative value to gold. And right now, Bitcoin is below $1 trillion in market cap. Gold is already $10 trillion. So if you want to look for an easy 10x, surely Bitcoin, if it survives, will become a $10 trillion cap asset at least and that's the base just getting to gold and it could go on well beyond that i believe because it, it can eat up a large majority of the financial sector that currently exists stocks bonds and everything else could be eaten by the likes of the bitcoin network because we're creating a new monetary network and it's you know the more you go down this rabbit hole the more you realize this is i'd currently say anyone on this call if you don't have bitcoin right now you're probably saying should i wait for the price to fall it's gone up so much recently Never wait for a dip. Never wait for a dip. And also, never go all in straight away. The biggest thing you have to do is commit to go from zero to one. And by that, I mean, think about your liquid net worth. You want to put at least go from zero, you know, being on the sidelines or being on the fence, you want to have 1% in the game because you'll learn so much just by buying it for the first time and understanding how to store it and learning more, that sparks the journey. And as you become more confident, as you understand it more, as you do the research, that's when you can start actually storing more of your own net worth within Bitcoin. And so I believe it's the hardest money that we've ever created on the planet. 
it's going to outperform gold and silver in the next decade because it currently is so much smaller in market cap. And think about this as well. This is something massive with Bitcoin. 3.7 billion people on the planet don't even have access to the internet today. That means 3.7 billion people on the planet cannot buy Bitcoin today, right? So the moment that Elon launches Starlink, it seems like Elon's doing everything right now, doesn't it? But if he launches Starlink, which is his low latency Wi-Fi broadband to cover the planet with his satellites, he's looking to launch this in the next few years. If he launches that and suddenly those 3.7 billion people come online, what do you have? You have a huge demand shock to the system of 3.7 billion people who can now transact in Bitcoin. And so the dynamics are such that I believe, you know, we're only just starting to see this beginning of, of the latest bull market. And yes, be careful, mitigate risk by only putting in what you're comfortable uh, to lose, because it could also fail. There could be a catastrophic black swan event as well, but it's been here for 12 years. And I truly believe that you can mitigate risk by having the right asset allocation. So yeah, just some thoughts there, Alan. So you just said it, it's like buying a part of the internet. And, you know, I totally agree. It's, it's like buying a part of the future, basically. Um, that, that's what that's what it is. You're buying. You, it's, a, it's a hedge, just like gold is. It's a hedge, and it's good. I'm I'm kind of glad actually, Matt, that you're on the side of Bitcoin and I'm on the side of gold here because we can have a little bit of final back and forth. Is that you know gold again can be um, you know liquidated into any currency. That's what I like. Gold isn't tied to one thing. Um, what's another benefit of gold? Well, if your parents have got gold. Um, and for inheritance, you know, I'm not being funny, but a gold bar can be pretty much handed into the hand of another one. Um, so its value is very transferable. Its value is good. Ima imagine if you had 100K in the bank and you passed away tomorrow, God forbid, and then your, uh, you know, your children or whoever then had to go through the probate process. Now, I'm just saying, imagine you had 100 grand worth of gold in a safe. Well, that's down to you and what you've set up with your children and where they need to go and dig the hole and everything like that. So it's very transferable. So gold is very good in that sense. Um, and that's why myself, my family have been have been buying gold uh, so forth for however long now. So I, li I like Matt's take on there. And I think just to give a bit of context, Matt. So really, Bitcoin is a part of a blockchain. It can be used for transactions, and it's basically a way of creating a new currency, which is decentralized at the moment, right, to give power, I think as someone put it, to the public. Now, my only thing would be with Bitcoin, Matt, I'm, and I, I like that we've got this bit of back and forth now, as I did a video on YouTube about gold versus Bitcoin, and I obviously am aware of something called painting the tape, where it can be manipulated in order to look great from the outside to attract those who perhaps aren't that experienced because they're driving up the price. The left hand's buying from the right, the right hand's selling back to the left. Prices are shooting up. They sell up. The institutional investors back off. Everyone drives the price up and then they buy at a really low price, that kind of thing. My only thing would be is, Matt, knowing that all the big institutions, the big governments, a lot of their money is held in centralized banks. You know, some of these guys who are billionaire, multi, multi billionaires, you know, the Rothschilds, big, big players who don't want to see Bitcoin come in because they're holding all their money still in the traditional ISAs. Um, will Bitcoin ever be able to fight the powers that be? And will the powers that be really realistically ever let Bitcoin get through? And just a final one, Matt, if you remember it towards the end, like Dan said, this has always been a question of mine. How do we know that they won't increase that 21 million cap? Yeah, so Bitcoin is, in terms of the cap initially, so the cap is a hard cap. It is a network that is based upon supporting the legitimacy of that being kept. And the fact that it's decentralized means that no one person has the power to change that. And if anyone did try to change it, quite simply, what would happen is there would be a hard fork of Bitcoin and the original would sustain the network effect. And this is what's already been attempted by people. So we've already seen this play out. For example, Litecoin was an early hard fork of the Bitcoin network. Litecoin is basically you know, the founder sold all his Litecoin to get more Bitcoin. And this is what you find with a bunch of these coins. XRP as well. I've been telling people, don't buy XRP. You don't know what you're doing because people get shiny object syndrome and they enter this space and they buy different tokens. And that's the critical thing. You've got to know. You've got to know what you're buying. And so that's why I say to everyone, just start by buying that first $10 or $100, whatever you feel comfortable with in Bitcoin, understand it first, and then go down the rabbit hole. 
and right and if i can help point you in the right direction you all have obviously my details to reach out to me on instagram or wherever as well uh, and aaron too right and we can support you with getting the right information because the biggest challenge i have is people who just take action blindly or get get emotional about it and still start buying stuff uh, without knowing what they're doing and i know a bunch of friends who kept on talking about ripple recently and then they had the sec ruling and the whole thing basically has collapsed in value and i you know for years i've i've been adamant that this thing showed all the signs of a scam because of how the founders behaved and reinvested into bitcoin and that's what the sec is bringing them up on so aside from that let's talk now about what i believe long term more and more people will move to bitcoin the, the reason is and this is also, this goes back to why gold and silver will win in the near term too. Gold and silver is going to do very well. So yes, do gold and silver still have place in a portfolio? Yes, I believe they do because they're less volatile than Bitcoin, typically. Not always, but typically. I mean, we saw a massive shocking price of gold, didn't we, after the last bull, bull run last year. Yeah. But, you know, traditionally speaking, they are more stable. If you look back at the last 10 years, when you can correlate with Bitcoin, Okay, so, so yes, they do have a space, I believe, in a portfolio too, but the expected return would be a lot less because they're a lot more mature in terms of their market, but also it's a higher market price asset, uh, sorry, market cap asset. And, and ultimately, most people don't understand even gold and silver yet. This is the critical thing. Most fund managers don't have any gold and silver in their portfolio, let alone Bitcoin. So I believe we're going through this huge journey of awakening, whereby a lot of the new Bitcoin holders, by the way, are traditional gold holders that have moved to Bitcoin because they're starting to diversify out of gold into Bitcoin for the same reasons. They want to escape the inflation of the fiat monetary system. But the, cha the challenge we have is educating the world on why Bitcoin is the hardest form of money that we've ever created. It's the most scarce form of money that we've ever created. And it can ultimately win long term, provided that we keep on empowering the network. And that's why you've seen the likes of Michael Saylor of MicroStrategy investing over $1 billion into Bitcoin the last six months. And I think we're going to see a trigger point this year of more and more institutions doing the same. Even recent days, you have the news media coming out saying Bitcoin's just collapsed the most that it ever had, $10,000 in a day or whatever it was, $12,000. But in percentage terms, that wasn't that much because we'd gone on such a massive price rise recently and then it retraced, but then everyone was buying it. it they, the exchanges have never had such volumes of people buying it. So the demand is only going up. I believe in the near term, gold and silver will do well. But then when it comes to portability, Gold and silver, they're not frictionless. You need to go through security at the airport. They'll look down your trousers and check if you've got gold and silver, <laughs> you know, through the metal detectors. Your Bitcoin, it's in the ether. It's in the internet. That's the beauty of it, is it's borderless. It's frictionless. And I believe that that's where we're going towards. It's almost an evolution. In, it really is an evolution in how we think about money and how we think about managing our wealth and transporting it. And, and the other thing, of course, is, you know, storage physical storage of gold and silver. If you are super wealthy, you need to have access to vaults. Whereas you can store a vast amount of wealth in Bitcoin and it would just sit on, on a ledger like that. You know, it, you could, that it's a lot easier to transport and to carry around than it would be if you're with gold. The other thing with gold is it's a lot gold and silver. You could steal that pretty easily. If someone takes my ledger, they still can't access my cryptos because they don't know my pass keys. They don't. And so, there's all this security that comes into it as well, which I believe long term we'll see a trigger of more and more people realizing that Bitcoin could be the winner. I just think we've got a lot of turbulence in the near term. If you're buying it, you're buying it to forget about it for the next five plus years. That's the way I treat it. I don't need to sell my Bitcoin because you get rewarded and compounded returns if you just hold for the long term. The same with gold and silver. Awesome. Uh, some really good points there, Matt. And I, I like the back and forth because also, you know, my, my take on that as well, Matt, I suppose, and, and just to quickly hear your final take on it is fraudulent wise, obviously in my eyes that you've got this big gap where um, I think I said it on my, my last gold versus Bitcoin, but, you know, we're always getting bombarded that 
you know we have we have an uncle that we didn't know about in the back of nowhere and that if we just pay that little bit of bitcoin that we can get our uncle back that we never knew about um they can keep my uncle if i don't know about them but you know we always kind of get those emails so you know it is open to fraud and stuff like that whereas for me i find that that's very hard to do with gold gold you can do your own simple magnet test you know as long as you're buying from a, a trusted broker you know i mean look some of you may have heard me say, but I buy from also a place from Sharps Pixley. They've been around for over 300 years. Um, funny enough, actually, Matt, you can use Bitcoin to buy gold. So Sharps Pixley, their history, their directors, the owners, they're obviously seeing something in the future, which is good, which is a good shout. I think I think the, the message really, you know, we can go back and forward from the Bitcoin and the gold. I think what we've both agreed on here, Matt, is one, it's a storage of wealth. We're not trading it. We're not trying to become a millionaire. We're not trying to buy at the lowest price and sell at the highest. We're storing and we're hedging our bets for a change that is inevitably going to come. We just don't really know exactly when it's going to come, but it is going to come. And the old money and the ones that want to leave it in the bank, well, uh, you know, if, if you're going to leave it in the bank, so be it. But that's obviously the whole point of this call is to kind of open up some eyes and really look at it. But I suppose really it's, it's about being diversified, isn't it, Matt? And just spreading, um, you know, spreading your money across all these different assets. Exactly. And, and going deep on that as well, it's, just, it's about spreading your money against all the legitimate assets, right? Yeah. Because people get caught up, they get caught up with the likes of these financial schemes. If anyone tries to sell you, I'll just say this, if anyone tries to sell you an MLM scheme, which is hidden as a crypto or Forex investment, run away from it and tell them to stop promoting. Okay, because if categorically, if someone's selling you that, it is showing the red flags of a Ponzi. I know a bunch of people who have sadly got drawn into a few this year. And it's my biggest frustration, you know, with my background in the financial sector, seeing families getting screwed over if they're the last ones to enter these, these schemes, right? So just that's what I would say is you don't want to put your money into everything. When we're saying diversify, diversify into legitimate assets. And if you don't know for sure that it's legitimate, you need to go and ask questions and just go on that journey of financial learning that we've all had to get to go through, Aaron and I, and all of us here on this call to get to where we are today, right? It's so, so critical. I'm so passionate about that because I hate seeing these, these schemes keep on penetrating the market, so to speak. It's just, it's wrong. It's, it's completely, sadly, the world is fueled by power and greed at certain levels, and we still see that as well. So, Yes, it is about diversifying, diversifying the real things. The same goes for cryptocurrencies. A bunch of them are scams because they're basically founders looking to make a, much, make a bunch of money and then buy more Bitcoin because they know that Bitcoin is where the value is. And that's what we saw in the ICO boom of 2016-17. People were just flocking, it's like the internet boom, flocking into these tokens which had no real intrinsic value. It was all based on an idea. You could basically launch an idea call it Matcoin, launch it and make a billion dollars and then buy a billion dollars worth of Bitcoin. It was that easy with a quick yeah. white paper and a nice looking website. And people were falling for it all over and people will still fall for that. So just be careful and, and just focus on, like I said, focus on the real assets within the system. And that's why we like Bitcoin, gold and silver as stores of wealth through this time and just make sure in property that you're diversifying into cash flow assets and watch out for the stock market too. Most people are very overexposed. Now we've not really touched on this today, Aaron, but a lot of people are very overexposed to the stock yeah. market. And that's why this diversification play is so critical for all of us, you know? Yeah, the stock, I mean, the, yeah, the stock market has obviously got its own story, but tangible assets like holding the Bitcoin, like holding the gold and silver. But just to answer and finish off there on Vignes, um about silver, I mean, just to, before we close it off, because obviously the time, but I look at it this way with regards to uh, gold and silver. Why would, um, if you had a chance to have Batman on your side or Robin, I'd always rather have Batman. So that's the kind of way that I break it down. Bit, stu bit stupid, bit silly, but that's the way that I look at it because Robin's always following Batman. So basically, you know, when there's an up, um, there's a great up for silver. However, the only thing when you look at silver, let's just look at it as black and white. Storing silver, if you were to spend a thousand pound on silver, you need to get yourself a big ass safe. Like you, you need to get yourself a big safe. You're hoarding a lot of silver. The gold, you spend a thousand pound, you might get a fingernail sized bit of gold. You know, that's the kind of difference. But the gold will always hold that value. Gold is what, you know, if, if you saw a silver bar and a gold bar on a table, you'd always take the gold bar. So 
that's why I just I purely deal in gold. I'm not bothered about silver. I don't want to I don't want to hoard silver because that's what it would end up being. Um, but what is silver really? Again, it's just a hedge and it's a storage of wealth, um, which you could dish out a lot quicker, I suppose. But just to finish it off, Matt, is there anything you want to finish on? Um, just wrapping it up now. Yeah, good shares, Alan. I think uh, I like the analogies there. Someone just posted in the chat. Would that mean bronze is Batgirl? <laughs> Shane's just yeah. Why not? <laughs> there we go. You get the approval. <laughs> Vote of approval from Alan and myself. <laughs> there. I think um, all I would say is it's all about the reason again to, to just reiterate this point. Diversification. It's about trying to capture the economic growth of the planet through different asset classes. You know, because the biggest expense you can make right now is not having a foot in the game of the fastest horse in the race, which the last 10 years has been Bitcoin by a long shot. And we all wish we had 1% of our portfolio, that thousand pounds or whatever it may have been or 10,000 or whatever it could have been back then, you know, in Bitcoin, right? So, so this is why it's so critical to just see this as it's a case of getting into different assets and then you can capture overall growth and diversify and save yourself. It's like planting an orchard of trees. If you're only watering one of the trees and focus on one of the trees, everything else will die, right? And eventually that, that tree as well could be overwatered. It's over-focused. And that's unfortunately how most of us build a portfolio is we focus on one thing, stocks typically. Pensions are all in stocks, ETFs, you know, and, and bonds, paper assets. You know, they're not necessarily in real estate or real assets. They might be in REITs, but not the real thing. So same as real estate investors. It's more about diversifying and just making sure we're aware of the options available. And, you know, it's been a pleasure on this call. It's a really good group that you've put together, Aaron. So thanks to everyone as well who's, who's been here and for the awesome comments in the chat. Let us know how we can be of service to you as well going forwards. Uh, I am actually, I know Aaron and I, we're both doing more live events into the future. One of the things I've been doing recently as well as some financial masterclasses, which I know some people on this call, uh, you were connected on the one I did before Christmas. So if you would like access to that, by all means, send me a message or I'll speak to Aaron after and probably send an email to some of you um, later this month, because I'd love to see some of you there to dive a bit deeper with a three hour session on, you know, some of the areas that we cover today because i think it's important we all deserve to preserve and grow our wealth through this time so make sure that you're positioned right and that you've got a game plan to succeed there's so much opportunity right now there really is and if you do it right you know you can come out the back end of 2021 with your life transformed so that's all i'd say Aaron. yeah awesome yeah time of opportunity especially with six week lockdown or god knows how long we're going to be locked down for just don't sit there twiddling your thumbs um Cool. Okay. Well, we'll wrap it up again. I've just second what Matt said. Thank you for everyone for joining Thursday evening. Uh, we could be doing other things. Not really, because you can't go anywhere, but <laughs> so why not sit here and listen to us drone on? But anyway, thank you very much for everyone joining. Really appreciate it. And Matt, it's been good fun and we'll definitely do some more. And my God, thank God when we can actually meet up and we get Mark involved and we'll have a few drinks and we get some other people involved. It'll be a good exactly. crack. We'll, we'll make that happen, mate. And it's been a pleasure. Thanks for putting this together, Aaron. And, you know, a lot of respect for you and all the work that you're doing with your community. No worries, my man. Cool. All right. Well, Matt, we'll catch up shortly, shall we? And um, again, thank you for everyone that's joined. And we will speak to all of you very soon. Thanks, everyone. Cheers, guys. Speak soon. Cheers, everyone. Bye-bye.